So we're now going to talk about the bottom boxes, revenue stream and cost structure. So this, in my mind, is also one of the, the <laughs> higher risk the higher risk areas. And so if you are, so here I believe that if you are um, going to charge for your product, if you have intentions, so it's not a Twitter or Facebook type application where it's multi-site and the customer is someone else, but you are going to charge your, your users for your, cost, for your product, I believe you have to start charging from day one. And, and there are a lot of people who say, well, you know, it's, we have to, the product is not quite ready yet, or it's kind of, it's, it's the MVP, it's not, it's buggy, I'm embarrassed by it, I'm not gonna, I can't possibly charge for it. And to that, I actually tell people that that's, then you don't quite have an MVP. Like, to, in my mind, an MVP is a product that's minimal, it, that's, it's minimal, but it's also viable. And it has to really hit on a compelling value proposition that if you are going to charge, people will be willing to pay for. So with that definition, you have to go and build that product, and it has to be as polished as is, as is required by the customer. So a lot of people say, well, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to invest a lot in design. Well, if you're selling to designers, it better be well-designed, or they will look at it as a low-quality product. But if you're selling to another audience that's not as, as, uh, as picky on design, you might be able to get away with a more functional product. So a lot of it is relative to that customer segment, but your MVP has to serve a, a viable uh, problem. It has to solve a real problem for customers, and if you are charging, that's something you test up front. You don't wait to, uh, in the interest of learning to see what will happen, because that's not kind of a, 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 a short strategy to like, get to a point where they'll, they, they may pay for, it, for your product. Um, yeah. Sure, so, I'll, I'll, so let's go on and I'll, I'll kind of talk about pricing in general. So the, the reason I think you have, to, that you have to test pricing early on is that pricing is one of those things that is part of the product. So to illustrate that, I'll kind of use this fictional example. If I had bottled water here and one was a dollar and one was three dollars, um, even, even without telling you what was in it, because it more likely is the same tap water that I just sourced from the same spring, have different packaging on it, but call one a dollar and one three dollars, but even without, without knowing that, and even knowing that most of the water, for the, for the most part, tastes the same, blind, blind taste tests tell you that the product is not that different from each other. In people's minds, there's this perception that the $3 bottle has to be higher quality, or it has to be something different about it. Not everyone believes that, but people who buy it feel like this is a better quality of water that they're getting. Um, so this is an example where the same product can be packaged differently, can be priced differently, and can actually drive a different audience. And we also know from the bottled water industry that there is a viable market at both price points. And so the, the, the more interesting question for you as the, the, the creator of that service or that product is which target audience do you want to attract? Because you can build a business in both of them. Do you want to go after the dollar business or the $3 business? And both are, are, are right answers, but that's where the second part also comes in is that the pricing you attach with your product also drives your customers. And so if you were trying to sell an enterprise uh, a product which was you know, $10 a month, they probably would not even, would, would not even consider it because they'd be concerned that um, in, in, the, in month two you'd probably just disappear because you aren't charging enough or they wouldn't get the right support. They're not going to build their whole, it would be far more expensive for them to chase you down uh, if their company depended on your product than if you charge them a lot and they knew that they were getting uh, an 800 number and a customer service representative and all that stuff that's needed <coughs> to keep them comfortable. So, so pricing is one of those things where it's not just part of the product, but it also drives the customers of your product. And then lastly, you know, getting paid is one of those very hard transactions to pull off. It's actually one of the hardest ones. It's, if you look at building any kind of product, you can, make, you, can, you can have people stumble on usability, you can go fix those things, but the most awkward thing is to have them kind of stop what they're doing. Uh, for most people don't memorize their credit card numbers, but they have to pull out their wallet punch in those 16 digits, you know, figure out the code at the back. It's actually a very convoluted process <coughs> to actually put in the credit card for the first time. And it has to be really compelling. There has to be a really, they have to be motivated to do it. And so it, if you get people to actually give you money, that's a good, that's a good validation that you're onto something. It's not the ultimate validation. So I kind of caution, I, I caution on the, on pricing not being the ultimate validation because sometimes you can, you can, you can be chasing the wrong money. So you might, have an idea to build a business model, but you get these one-off deals where a customer contacts you or a, or a client contacts you and wants to license some technology of yours, and you're not in the licensing business, and sure, that's an easy way to make a sale, and that month your revenues might look good, but that's not necessarily the business model you are going to build. So, so revenue may not always, if you just look at it purely from the revenue sense, may not be an indicator of building something of value or building a business model that will scale. The other thing I also find is that sometimes even with subscription businesses, you can get into the trap of 
getting these false positives. So I was I had this box cloud product which had many paying customers. Some of them were paying for years. Um, and so after about after some time, I wanted to go ahead and get testimonials from them. And so I would send these emails out to people who had been on for a year or longer. And I would get out not all not a lot, but I would sometimes get these. I would get these weird responses back saying, you know, what is BoxCloud and why are we still paying for and why are we paying for the service? So th these were examples of people who uh, or companies who had somebody else in the company sign up for the service, um, not get value out of it, eventually like leave it, but forget to cancel or really not care about it because um, when we pressed them further, we found out that the person was no longer in the company or maybe the process was too hard for them to cancel out of because it was somebody else's credit card or things like that. And so it was just a case where people kept paying for this product even though they weren't using it. So I don't find, so I find that for the most part, revenue uh, is a good indicator, but it's not necessarily the ultimate indicator for building something of value. You really have to measure retention, and by retention, it is it's getting people coming back and using your product repeatedly, and that's the ultimate indicator for for building something of value or measuring measuring that value. So in that example, had I been looking more closely at my retention numbers, I would see that there, uh, there are these groups of users that are paying but not using the service. And that would kind of give me a clearer picture of, of what, what is really uh, working or not in the product.